Hey, NCLEX aspirants. Today, we're delving into the crucial NCLEX questions and answers related to the respiratory system. We've selected these 50 questions that were asked multiple times by the board last year, so there's a higher chance that these questions may be repeated in your next exam. Stick with us until the end to grasp all the important NCLEX review questions. Let's start the video. A female client with systemic lupus erythematous has developed shrinking lung syndrome and is on a prescribed course of prednisone. What symptom might she experience if she abruptly discontinues the medication? A. Hyperglycemia and glycosuria. B. Acute adrenocordial insufficiency. C. Gastrointestinal hemorrhage. D. Restlessness and seizures. Correct answer, B. Acute adrenocordial insufficiency. Let's delve into why this is the correct answer. Prednisone is a corticosteroid, and its long-term use can suppress the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal HPA axis. This axis is crucial for regulating cortisol production in the body. When a patient abruptly stops taking prednisone, particularly after a prolonged period, it can lead to a sudden drop in cortisol levels. This condition is known as acute adrenocortal insufficiency, a serious health risk. It's important to taper the dose gradually to allow the HPA axis to recover and resume normal cortisol production. This gradual tapering helps prevent the sudden onset of adrenal insufficiency. Other options, A, C, and D, hyperglycemia and glycosuria, GI bleeding and restlessness and seizures are common side effects of corticosteroid therapy. However, they are not directly linked to the abrupt cessation of prednisone. A patient with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD, is prescribed theophylline for management of their condition. The healthcare provider emphasizes the importance of monitoring the patient's serum theophylline level to ensure therapeutic effectiveness and avoid toxicity. What is the therapeutic range for serum theophylline concentration? Stand code, A, NCLEX code. 5 to 10 mcg per milliliter. B, 2 to 5 mcg per milliliter. C, 10 to 20 mcg per milliliter. D, 1 to 2 mcg per milliliter. Here, option C is correct. The normal therapeutic level for theophylline is 10 to 20 mcg per milliliter. Theophylline operates through two primary mechanisms. It blocks adenosine receptors, leading to effects like bronchodilation, and at higher doses, tachycardia, cardiac arrhythmias, seizures, and cerebral vasoconstriction. Additionally, at larger doses, it inhibits phosphodiesterase, increasing CAMP, and adrenergic activation, causing elevated catecholamine release. Theophylline toxicity can significantly increase epinephrine and norepinephrine levels, leading to cardiac arrhythmias, metabolic acidosis, hyperglycemia, and hypokalemia. Chronic toxicity can occur from drug accumulation. Therefore, monitoring serum theophylline levels is crucial. Interesting fact, did you know there is another drug with the same therapeutic serum range? Phenytoin, used for managing epilepsy, also has a therapeutic range of 10 to 20 mcg per milliliter. In an emergency room with a case of acute pulmonary edema, a male patient suddenly sits up, experiencing dyspnea and an oxygen saturation of 85%. Which oxygen delivery method would be best to alleviate these symptoms? A. A simple mask. B. Nasal cannula. C non-rebreather mask, D, a face tent. The correct answer is C, a non-rebreather mask. To effectively address any question regarding oxygen delivery systems, a thorough understanding of both high flow and low flow oxygen devices is indispensable. We begin with low flow systems, typically used when a patient's respiratory rate and pattern remain stable. It's important to note that in these systems, the actual fraction of inspired oxygen, FiO2, can fluctuate with each breath. Common low flow systems encompass the nasal cannula, simple face mask, and both partial rebreather and non-rebreather masks. 
The nasal cannula is a prevalent choice for mild hypoxia, adjustable between 1 and 6 liters per minute LPM, correlating to an FiO2 of approximately 24% to 40%. Notably, with each liter increase in O2, FiO2 rises by about 4%. The simple face mask, alternatively, is optimal for delivering moderate oxygen levels, offering FiO2 levels between 35 and 55% at 5 to 10 LPM. The partial rebreather mask, incorporating a reservoir bag, captures exhaled oxygen from the anatomic dead space, beneficial in oxygen conservation. Delivering an FiO2 between 0.6 and 0.8, this mask requires over 8 liters per minute of fresh gas flow to maintain bag inflation and ensure efficient CO2 evacuation. The non-rebreather mask, an advancement of the partial rebreather, includes additional valves for unidirectional gas flow and prevents room air attainment. This mask can deliver the highest FiO2 of 0.9 to 1.0 at a fresh gas flow of 12 to 15 liters per minute, suitable for severe hypoxia. However, its prolonged use can be uncomfortable and requires careful monitoring to avoid CO2 buildup and suffocation. Shifting to high-flow oxygen systems, these are crucial for patients with inconsistent respiratory rates and patterns. The Venturi mask stands out here, especially for COPD patients delivering precise FiO2 levels from 24% to 50%. This category also includes the nebulizer, high-flow nasal cannula, and mechanical ventilation, adaptable to a wide array of clinical conditions, particularly in severe cases. Concluding with specialized systems, we have devices like the trach collar, designed for tracheostomy patients. It provides either oxygen or humidified air, with settings similar to the Venturi mask for precise oxygen delivery. Before we move on to the next question, we have urgent news for you. We've meticulously crafted a 100-hour animated NCLEX review crash course. In the initial 30 hours, we comprehensively cover all the crucial NCLEX topics with engaging animations. But that is just the beginning. The remaining 70 hours are dedicated to dissecting 5,000 NCLEX questions through dynamic animations. Along with animated lectures, you will also get NGN questions, an ebook, practice test series, and many more resources. Imagine learning with interactive visuals instead of being buried in a mound of tedious text. Say farewell to monotonous study sessions and welcome a revolutionary animated learning experience. This 100-hour course is your passport to mastering the NCLEX exam with unwavering confidence. Remember, animation significantly enhances information retention. Don't miss out on this limited-time offer. We're offering an astounding 70% off for this month only. Click the link below, enroll today, and embark on a journey where animated education leads to exam triumph. Your success story begins now with our 100-hour animated NCLEX course at an incredible 70% off. Enroll immediately and wave goodbye to dreary textbooks. Now, let's swiftly move on to the next question. At 10 a.m., a male client is admitted to the emergency department with a respiratory rate of 40 breaths per minute. He appears anxious and exhibits audible wheezes. Upon admission, he is immediately given oxygen via a partial rebreather mask and receives an intravenous dose of methylprednisolone. At 10.30 a.m., the client's arterial blood oxygen saturation is measured at 84%, and he continues to wheeze. What should the nurse plan to administer next? A. Salbutamol B. Propranolol C. Midazolam D. Morphine the correct answer is option A, salbutamol. Let's understand the rationale behind it. The client is experiencing hypoxemia due to bronchoconstriction, as indicated by the wheezing and a below normal Stand arterial code. oxygen NCLEX saturation code. level of 84%. The most immediate need for the client is bronchodilation. Salbutamol is a beta-2 adrenergic agonist and is effective in inducing dilation of the bronchioles. It can be administered through nebulizations or as a metered dose inhaler and may be used as often as every 30 to 60 minutes until the patient experiences symptomatic relief. 
The next option to consider is propranolol, which is not suitable for treating bronchial constriction or respiratory problems. Propranolol is primarily used for managing hypertension and certain cardiovascular issues. However, if a patient is suffering from both asthma and hypertension, propranolol is not an advisable choice. The reason for this lies in understanding the different types of beta blockers. This is because beta receptors, which these medications target, are found in both the heart and lungs. In asthma, beta agonists, which activate these receptors, help relax the airways for easier breathing. Beta blockers, on the other hand, block these receptors. While this is beneficial for heart-related issues, it can be problematic for the lungs in asthma patients. Blocking these receptors can lead to narrowed airways, potentially worsening asthma symptoms such as shortness of breath, wheezing, and exacerbation of asthma. There are two main categories of beta blockers, non-selective and selective beta blockers. Non-selective beta blockers like propranolol affect both the heart and lung receptors and can worsen asthma symptoms. Therefore, they are generally contradicted in asthma patients. Conversely, selective beta blockers are typically safer for individuals with asthma as they mainly target the heart with minimal impact on the lungs. Selective beta blockers such as metoprolol, esmolol, atenolol, nabivolol, and bisiprolol are often preferred for asthmatic patients who need a beta blocker. Their safety in asthma patients is due to their selective action on the heart, reducing the risk of aggravating asthma symptoms. Morphine, which depresses the respiratory center, and midazolam, a sedative, could potentially suppress respiratory function in this patient and are not indicated for treating bronchial constriction. Understanding bronchodilators is crucial for managing respiratory conditions, and it's important to be familiar with the three main types, beta-2 agonists, anticholergenics, and theophylline. Beta-2 agonists are divided into short-acting and long-acting forms. The short-acting beta-2 agonists, like albuterol and levobuterol, act quickly to relieve acute asthma symptoms, becoming effective within 15 to 20 minutes and lasting for about 4 to 6 hours. They're often termed as rescue medications due to their rapid onset of action. Long-acting beta-2 agonists, such as salmeterol and formoterol, are utilized for the long-term control of asthma. Anticholinergics, including eprotropium bromide and teotropium bromide, block the neurotransmitter acetylchlorine and are effective in managing chronic asthma symptoms. They are not designed for quick relief, but offer sustained control of symptoms. Let's transition to the next NCLEX questions and answers. In a COPD patient administered supplemental oxygen through a non-rebreather mask, which parameter in the arterial blood gas analysis best reflects the efficacy of the oxygenation therapy? A. pH B. Partial pressure of arterial oxygen, PaO2 C. Bicarbonate, HCO3 D. Partial pressure of arterial carbon dioxide, PaCO2. The correct answer is option B. The PaO2 value is the primary and most direct measure for assessing the success of oxygen therapy in this context. The PaO2 level helps in determining the adequacy of oxygen supplementation and in making necessary adjustments to the patient's oxygen therapy. This may include modifications to the oxygen delivery system, for example, changing from a non-rebreather mask to other devices like a nasal cannula or a mechanical ventilator, as well as adjustments to the flow rate and concentration of oxygen provided. The other listed parameters, while important in overall patient assessment, primarily give insights into the patient's respiratory and metabolic status rather than directly indicating the effectiveness of oxygenation. Before an arterial blood sample is taken for ABG analysis, the Allen test is crucial for ensuring the patency of the radial and ulnar arteries. The patient first raises their arm and clenches their fist, cutting off blood flow. The clinician then occludes both the ulnar and radial arteries. Upon opening the fist, the hand appears pale due to blood flow cessation. The clinician releases one artery to observe the hand's color return, which should ideally happen within 5 to 7 seconds, indicating good arterial flow. The test is repeated for the other artery. 
A delay beyond 7 to 10 seconds suggests potential arterial insufficiency, highlighting the importance of the Allen test in determining a safe puncture site for ABG analysis. Here's the next NCLEX questions and answers. How can cyanosis be assessed in a person with darkly pigmented skin? A. Earlobes B. Mucous membranes C. Lips D. Nail beds the correct choice is B, mucous membranes. This is correct because the color of mucous membranes is less affected by skin pigmentation, making them a more reliable indicator of cyanosis in individuals with dark skin. Moving to the next NCLEX question. To facilitate optimal gas exchange in a patient with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD, which nursing intervention is the most appropriate? A administering a prescribed anxiolytic medicine. B. Encouraging the patient to consume a daily fluid intake of 1,500 milliliters. C. Maintaining the patient in semi-fowler's position. D. Employing a high-flow venturi mask for oxygen delivery as per prescription. Here, option D is the correct choice because patients with COPD have elevated carbon dioxide levels, which can inhibit the central respiratory drive. Administering unspecified sedatives may potentially depress the respiratory center. To enhance gas exchange, the nurse should employ a Venturi mask to provide a precisely controlled oxygen concentration. Encouraging a daily fluid intake of 1,500 milliliters is unlikely to directly impact gas exchange or adequately liquefy secretions common in COPD. Placing the patient in a semi fowler's position may assist in respiratory comfort, but oxygenation is better managed with controlled oxygen therapy. Moving forward, let's explore another NCLEX question and answer. What is the recommended duration for initially occluding the opening in the tracheostomy tube of a female client who does not require continuous mechanical ventilation? A. 5 to 60 seconds. B. 5 to 20 minutes. C. 45 to 60 minutes. D. 30 to 40 minutes. Correct answer is option B. 5 to 20 minutes. Initially, the nurse should occlude the tracheostomy tube for a period ranging from 5 to 20 minutes, subsequently extending this duration based on the patient's respiratory status. Clients not dependent on continuous mechanical ventilation are capable of independent breathing, albeit for limited durations. Therefore, occluding the tracheostomy tube for a brief period of only 15 to 60 seconds is insufficient to accurately assess the patient's tolerance to spontaneous breathing. On the other hand, extending the occlusion beyond 20 minutes initially may elevate the risk of acute respiratory distress. This is because patients need a gradual adaptation phase to transition effectively to normal respiratory function. A common question in exams focuses on the average duration for suctioning in a tracheostomy tube. It's crucial to remember that suctioning should be brief, typically lasting no longer than 10 to 15 seconds per pass. This is important to minimize oxygen deprivation and potential trauma to the tracheal mucosa. Let's delve into the next round of NCLEX questions and answers. A male patient presents with arterial blood gas values showing a pH of 7.48, PaCO2 at 25 millimeters Hg, O2 saturation at 97%, HCO3 at 26 MEq per liter, and PaO2 at 95 millimeters Hg. Consider the following interventions. Which one would be most medically appropriate? A. Providing prescribed supplemental oxygen therapy. B. Administering a prescribed decongestant, such as pseudoephedrine. C. Instructing the patient to engage in rebreathing exercises using a paper bag. D. Ensuring frequent hydration of the patient. The correct answer is option C. Instructing the patient to engage in rebreathing exercises using a paper bag. The ABG results reveal a pH of 7.48, which is above the normal range, indicating alkalosis. Additionally, the PaCO2 is at 25 millimeters Hg lower than the normal range, further suggesting a condition of respiratory alkalosis. The rebreathing exercise is a direct method to increase PaCO2 by retaining exhaled carbon dioxide, 
thereby addressing the underlying cause of the alkalosis. Other options, such as administering a decongestant like pseudoephedrine, providing supplemental oxygen, or ensuring frequent hydration do not directly address the lowered PaCO2 level and are less suitable in this specific clinical context. A nurse is managing a male patient with a chest tube and it becomes disconnected from the drainage system. What is the appropriate nursing action? A. Immediately clamp the chest tube. B. Apply an occlusive dressing and promptly inform the physician. C. Secure the disconnected chest tube with tape. D. Submerge the end of the chest tube in a container of sterile saline. The right answer is option D. Placing the end of the chest tube in sterile saline. This prevents air from entering the chest tube and avoids negative respiratory pressure complications. Clamping the chest tube is not recommended due to the risk of developing a tension pneumothorax. Applying an occlusive dressing is indicated if the chest tube is removed from the patient, not when it's merely disconnected from the drainage system. Securing the tube with tape is a preventative measure against disconnection, but is not the correct immediate action once the disconnection has occurred. This question evaluates the student's ability to apply correct emergency procedures in the event of a chest tube system disconnection. Transitioning to the next important NCLEX question and answer. Which test can identify past or present exposure to tuberculosis, but may show a positive result in patients vaccinated with BCG regardless of actual exposure? A. Tuberculin skin test, PPD. B. Chest radiography. C. Lung scan. D. Bronchoscopy. The correct answer? A. Tuberculin skin test. The tuberculin skin test, PPD, is designed to detect both past and present exposure to tuberculosis. It involves administering a purified protein derivative intradermally and then monitoring for a skin reaction. It's important to note that individuals who have received the Baxil Kamet Garong BCG vaccine may test positive on this test, regardless of actual TB exposure. This is due to the vaccine's impact on the immune response, potentially leading to false positive results. This characteristic differentiates the PPD test from other diagnostic procedures, like chest radiography, lung scans, and bronchoscopies in assessing for tuberculosis. Moving on to the next important NCLEX question and answer. A hospital nurse observes wheezing, brachycardia, and a respiratory rate of 10 breaths per minute in a patient with advanced lung cancer. These signs indicate A. Hypoxia B. Hyperventilation C. Semi-consciousness D. Delirium The correct option is A. Hypoxia The observed symptoms like wheezing, brachycardia, and a respiratory rate of 10 breaths per minute suggest a state of hypoxia, which occurs when there is insufficient oxygen reaching the tissues. In advanced lung cancer, respiratory depression can lead to hypoxia, manifesting in these specific signs. The other options are not consistent with the described symptoms. Hyperventilation is marked by increased respiratory rate or tidal volume. Semi-consciousness is characterized by impaired consciousness with limited motor or verbal responses, and delirium involves mental confusion. Advancing to the next important NCLEX question and answer. A nurse is instructing a client with emphysema on pursed lip breathing. The client inquires about the purpose of this technique. The nurse should explain that A. It increases inspiratory muscle strength. B. It helps prevent early airway collapse. C. It prolongs the inspiratory phase of respiration. D. It decreases use of accessory breathing muscles. The correct option is B. It helps prevent early airway collapse. Pursed lip breathing is designed to prevent early airway collapse. This technique assists the client in managing respiration during moments of excitement, anxiety, exercise, and respiratory distress. To build inspiratory muscle strength, inspiratory resistive breathing may be more suitable, while diaphragmic breathing is recommended to decrease the use of accessory muscles and reduce the overall work of breathing. Pursed lip breathing specifically mimics a normal inspiratory-expiratory, or IE, ratio of 1 to 2, which can be beneficial for clients with emphysema, 
where the IE ratio may be as high as 1 to 4. Shifting our attention to the next important NCLEX question and answer. The nurse administers ipratropium bromide as prescribed to a client with emphysema. Which finding indicates that the drug is producing a therapeutic effect? A. Respiratory rate of 20 breaths Stand per minute. NCLEX B. Dilated and reactive pupils. C. Heart rate of 110 beats per minute. D. Urine output of 40 milliliters per hour. The correct option is A. In a client with emphysema, ipratropium bromide is used as a bronchodilator. A respiratory rate of 20 breaths per minute indicates that the drug has achieved its therapeutic effect because fewer respirations are needed for adequate oxygenation. Ipratropium bromide does not affect pupil reaction nor urine output, while it may cause changes in heart rate, an increased heart rate of 110 beats per minute is considered an adverse, not therapeutic, effect. Progressing to the next important NCLEX question and answer. What is the most common complication of influenza? A. Meningitis B. Septicemia C. Pulmonary edema D. Pneumonia The right answer is option D. Pneumonia Pneumonia, whether primary influenza viral pneumonia or secondary to a bacterial infection, is the most common complication of influenza. Stepping in to the next important NCLEX question and answer. A male client with myasthenia gravis develops respiratory acidosis due to reduced alveolar ventilation. Which combination of arterial blood gas, ABG values, confirms respiratory acidosis? A. pH 7.35, PaCO2 40 mm per Hg. B. pH 7.28, PaCO2 55 mm per Hg. C. pH 7.40, PaCO2 35 mm Hg. D. pH 5.0, PaCO2 30 mm per Hg. The right answer is option B. pH 7.28, PaCO2 55 mm per Hg. In respiratory acidosis, ABG analysis reveals an arterial pH below 7.35 and partial pressure of arterial carbon dioxide, PaCO2, above 45 mm per Hg. Therefore, the combination of a pH value of 7.28 and a PaCO2 value of 55 mm per Hg confirms respiratory acidosis. Advancing to the next important NCLEX question and answer. For a client with a chest tube connected to a closed water seal drainage system, the nurse should include which action in the plan of care? A. Keeping the collection chamber at chest level. B. Measuring and documenting the drainage in the collection chamber. C. Stripping the chest tube every hour. D. Maintaining continuous bubbling in the water seal chamber. The right answer is option B. The nurse should measure and document the amount of chest tube drainage regularly to detect abnormal drainage patterns, such as may occur with a hemorrhage or a blockage. Continuous bubbling in the water seal chamber indicates a leak in the closed chest drainage system, which must be corrected. The nurse should keep the collection chamber below chest level to allow fluids to drain into it. The nurse should not strip chest tubes because doing so may traumatize the tissue or dislodge the tube. Transitioning to the next important NCLEX questions and answers. In caring for a male client who has recently undergone a tracheostomy, the first priority is A. Helping him communicate B. Keeping his airway patent C. Encouraging him to perform activities of daily living. D. Preventing him from developing an infection. The correct answer is option B. Because maintaining a patent airway is the most basic and critical human need. All other interventions are important to the client's well-being, but not as important as having sufficient oxygen to breathe. Moving forward to the next important NCLEX questions and answers. Which condition serves as a predisposing factor for respiratory alkalosis in a female client? A. Narcotic overdose B. Type 1 diabetes mellitus C. Extreme anxiety D. Myasthenia gravis The right answer is option C. 
Extreme anxiety can lead to respiratory alkalosis by inducing hyperventilation, resulting in excessive loss of carbon dioxide, CO2. Additional conditions contributing to respiratory alkalosis include fever, heart failure, injury to the brain's respiratory center, overventilation with a mechanical ventilator, pulmonary embolism, and early solicitate intoxication. It's essential to note that while type 1 diabetes mellitus may lead to diabetic ketoacidosis, the deep rapid respirations characteristic of this disorder, Cosmol's respirations, do not cause excessive CO2 loss. Conversely, myasthenia gravis and narcotic overdose suppress the respiratory drive, leading to CO2 retention and the potential development of respiratory acidosis, not alkalosis. Entering the next important NCLEX question and answer. When should the nurse perform chest physiotherapy for a male adult client with cystic fibrosis admitted to an acute care facility with an acute respiratory infection? A. Immediately before meal. B. When bronchospasms occur. C. At least two hours after a meal. D. When secretions have mobilized. The right answer is option C. Chest physiotherapy is best conducted at least two hours after a meal to minimize the risk of vomiting and aspiration. Performing it just before a meal could exhaust the client and hinder their ability to eat. Notably, percussion and vibration, integral aspects of chest physiotherapy, may exacerbate bronchospasms. Hence, the procedure is not recommended for clients experiencing bronchospasms. Additionally, if secretions have mobilized, particularly in cases where suction equipment is unavailable, it is advised to refrain from postural drainage, another component of chest physiotherapy. Before we move forward, here's some exciting news. Our 100-hour animated NCLEX review course is now available at a whopping 70% discount for this month only. In the first 30 hours, we cover all essential NCLEX topics with engaging animations, then dive into 5,000 NCLEX questions all brought to life with dynamic animation. Plus, you'll get access to NGN questions, an ebook, mock tests, and more. Say goodbye to dull textbooks and hello to an interactive learning experience. Enroll now and secure your success with our animated NCLEX course. Click the link in the description box to get started. Transitioning to the next important NCLEX review question. Upon arrival at the emergency department, a critically ill female patient experiences respiratory arrest and is subsequently placed on mechanical ventilation. The attending physician orders pulse oximetry for non-invasive monitoring of the patient's arterial oxygen saturation, SAO2. Which deviation in vital signs has the potential to influence pulse oximetry readings? A. Elevated heart rate B. Low blood pressure C. Rapid breathing D. Elevated body temperature The right answer is option B. Low blood pressure, hypothermia, and vasoconstriction can impact pulse oximetry values by reducing arterial blood flow. Similarly, movement of the finger where the oximeter is applied may interfere with the accurate interpretation of SAO2. These conditions limit the reliability of pulse oximetry. Conversely, an elevated body temperature, rapid breathing, and an elevated heart rate do not directly affect pulse oximetry values. Moving on to the next important NCLEX review question. A nurse is caring for a patient being treated for aspiration pneumonia who is currently receiving oxygen through a Venturi mask. Which of the following findings is a classical sign and symptom indicating that the patient may be developing acute respiratory distress syndrome, ARDS? A. The patient's blood pressure is 170 over 90. B. The patient's respiratory rate is 10 breaths per minute. C. The patient appears tired and confused. D. The patient's PaO2 remains at 50 mm Hg using a Venturi mask. The correct answer is D. A characteristic sign of ARDS is refractory hypoxemia, where the patient remains hypoxic despite receiving a high concentration of oxygen, such as with a Venturi mask. 
Option D is the most relevant as it indicates that the patient's arterial oxygen level remains at 50 mmHg. Normal is 80 to 100 mmHg with a goal of at least 60 mmHg when treating ARDS. While fatigue and confusion can result from low oxygen levels, the question specifically seeks the classical sign and symptom associated with ARDS, which is refractory hypoxemia. Advancing to the next important NCLEX review question. As a nurse, during the exudative phase of acute respiratory distress syndrome, ARDS, we closely monitor the patient's condition. Specifically, we focus on the alveolar type 2 cells responsible for producing surfactant. Now, what happens if these crucial cells become damaged? A. Formation of upper airway blockage. B. Onset of pulmonary edema. C. Development of atelectasis. D. Increased bronchoconstriction. The correct answer is C. Development of atelectasis. Let's delve into this. Surfactant, produced by these alveolar type 2 cells, plays a pivotal role in reducing surface tension in the lungs. This reduction prevents the collapse of alveoli sacs during exhalation. So what occurs if there's damage to these cells? This is essentially the collapse of lung tissue. When surfactant production decreases due to damage to alveolar type 2 cells, it leads to unstable alveoli sacs. The consequence is atelectasis, a condition where the lung tissue collapses. Shifting our attention to the next important NCLEX review question. The most important nursing diagnosis for a male client admitted to a healthcare facility for treatment of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD, is A. Anxiety due to health threat B. Fatigue-related activity intolerance C. Impaired gas exchange from airflow obstruction D. Infection risk due to retained secretions Option C is the correct choice here. Maintaining a patient airway and ensuring an adequate breathing pattern are the utmost priorities for any client. Therefore, the most critical nursing diagnosis is impaired gas exchange related to airflow obstruction. While other options may be relevant, they are of lesser importance in this context. Progressing to the next important NCLEX review question. Which assessment parameter should the nurse prioritize before weaning a female client from a ventilator? A. Electrocardiogram ECG results. B. Fluid intake for the last 24 hours. C. Baseline arterial blood gas ABG levels. D. Previous responses to weaning attempts. The correct answer, option C. Baseline arterial blood gas levels. The primary consideration before weaning a client from mechanical ventilation is to assess the baseline arterial blood gas, ABG, levels. This provides crucial information about the client's respiratory status and helps gauge their tolerance to the weaning process. Monitoring ABG levels during weaning is essential for evaluating the client's ability to manage ventilation independently. While other assessments such as fluid intake and previous responses to weaning attempts are relevant, they are secondary in importance during the initial stages of weaning. Monitoring fluid balance is a routine aspect of care during mechanical ventilation, and information on prior weaning attempts can be valuable, but it is not as directly linked to the immediate weaning process as ABG levels. Stepping in to the next important NCLEX review question. Following a bronchoscopy, a female client has returned to the nursing unit. Which nursing intervention would the nurse implement for this client? A. Administering glycopyrrolate. B. Administering small doses of midazolam as an anti-anxiety drug. C. Encouraging additional fluids for the next 24 hours. Stancoast NCLEX coaching. D. Ensuring the return of the gag reflex before offering food or fluids. The correct answer is option D, ensuring the return of the gag reflex before offering food or fluids. Following a bronchoscopy, the nurse maintains the client on NPO, nothing by mouth, status until the gag reflex returns. 
This precaution is essential as preoperative sedation and local anesthesia can impair swallowing and the protective larginal reflexes for an extended period. No additional fluids are required post-procedure since no contrast dye is used that would necessitate flushing from the system. It's important to note that medications such as glycopyrrolate and midazolam are typically administered before the procedure, not afterward. Advancing to the next important NCLEX review question. What term refers to the quantity of air inhaled and exhaled during a single breath? A. Total lung capacity. B. Dead space volume. C. Vital capacity. D. Tidal volume. The right answer is option D. Tidal volume. Tidal volume represents the amount of air inspired and expired in a single breath. Total lung capacity, which includes the total volume of air accommodated in the lungs at the end of forced inspiration, is the sum of vital capacity and residual volume representing the maximum amount of air the lungs can hold. Dead space volume accounts for the air that remains in the upper airways and doesn't reach the alveoli. Vital capacity is the maximum air volume that can be expelled after a complete inhalation and exhalation. In certain pathological conditions, dead space may also extend into the lower airways. Transitioning to the next important NCLEX review question. A nurse is attending to a patient with chest tube drainage when inadvertently the patient is turned to the side causing the chest tube to disconnect from the drainage system. In this critical situation, what should be the nurse's initial response? A. Submerge the tube in a bottle of sterile water. B. Promptly replace the chest tube system. C. Contact the physician. D. Apply a sterile dressing over the disconnection site. The correct answer is option A. Submerge the tube in a bottle of sterile water. In the event of a chest drainage system disconnection, the immediate action is to immerse the exposed tube end in a bottle of sterile water placed below the chest level. Replacement of the chest tube system is warranted if there is observable damage, such as breakage, cracks, or when the collection chamber is full. Merely applying a sterile dressing over the disconnection site is insufficient to prevent potential complications. While notifying the physician may be necessary, it's not the primary and immediate action in this situation. Moving forward to the next important NCLEX review question. After assisting a physician in inserting a chest tube, a nurse observes a fluctuation of the fluid level in the water sealed chamber of an adult client. What would be an appropriate course of action based on this assessment? A. Notify the physician. B. Continue to monitor the client. C. Reinforce the occlusive dressing. D. Encourage the client to deep breathe. The correct answer is option B. The presence of fluctuation in the fluid level of the water seal chamber indicates a patent drainage system. Normal breathing causes the water level to rise with inspiration and fall with expiration. Fluctuation cessation may indicate tube obstruction, the presence of a dependent loop, suction malfunction, or lung re-expansion. Option B, continuing to monitor the client, is appropriate in this context. Options A, C, and D are considered incorrect. Entering the next important NCLEX review question. What respiratory changes would a nurse expect while assessing the respiratory status of a male client with a fractured rib? A, rapid, deep respirations. B, pain particularly during inspiration. C. Slow, deep respirations. D. Paradoxical respirations. The correct answer is option B. Pain, particularly during inspiration. Rib fractures, often resulting from blunt trauma or falls, commonly present with localized pain and tenderness, exacerbated by both palpation and inspiration. Shallow respirations, Guarding of the chest to limit movement and potential bruising at the fracture site are typical observations. Paradoxical respirations, characterized by uneven chest movement, are associated with a flail chest. A female patient has been admitted after sustaining chest trauma in a motor vehicle accident, necessitating subsequent intubation. 
During routine ventilation monitoring, a nurse responds to the activation of the high-pressure alarm and observes the absence of breath sounds in the right upper lobe of the lung. The nurse promptly conducts an assessment for additional signs related to A. Displaced endotracheal tube B. Acute respiratory distress syndrome C. Right pneumothorax D. Pulmonary embolism the right answer is option C, right pneumothorax. Pneumothorax manifests with restlessness, tachycardia, dyspnea, pain during respiration, asymmetrical chest expansion, and diminished or absent breath sounds on the affected side. Increased airway pressure may result from resistance to lung inflation in pneumothorax. Absent breath sounds are not typically associated with acute respiratory distress syndrome or pulmonary embolism. Although a displaced endotracheal tube can cause absent breath sounds, it's more likely on the left side due to the curvature of the right and left main stem bronchi. Let's delve into the next NCLEX questions and answers. A patient has been hospitalized in the ICU due to severe pneumonia. The patient's respiratory function has been deteriorating over the last 24 hours. The physician suspects acute respiratory distress syndrome, ARDS, a stat chest x-ray is ordered. What finding on the chest x-ray is indicative of ARDS? A. Heart enlargement accompanied by bilateral lower lobe infiltrates. B. Chest x-ray appearing normal. C. Bilateral whiteout infiltrates. D. Infiltrates solely present in the upper lobes. The correct answer is C. Bilateral whiteout infiltrates. In ARDS, a key radiographic feature is the presence of bilateral whiteout infiltrates on the chest x-ray, indicating severe lung involvement and loss of aeration. This finding aligns with the pathophysiology of ARDS, which can be triggered by severe pneumonia, leading to inflammation and fluid accumulation in the lungs. Let's dive into the next NCLEX questions and answers. A patient undergoing mechanical ventilation with positive end expiratory pressure PEEP, may develop complications that require immediate attention. Which of the following findings indicates a potential complication related to this therapy and warrants prompt intervention? A. Blood pressure 70 over 45. B. PaO2 80 mmHg. C. HCO3 26 mmHg. D. PaCO2 38 mmHg. The correct answer is A. Mechanical ventilation with PEEP can lead to increased intrathoracic pressure, potentially compromising cardiac output and resulting in hypotension. Monitoring blood pressure is crucial to identify and address any hemodynamic instability promptly. Other parameters such as HCO3, PaO2, and PaCO2 are important indicators, but may not directly signal the immediate cardiovascular complications associated with mechanical ventilation and PEEP. Here is the next NCLEX questions and answers. A patient is presenting with respiratory failure attributed to pulmonary edema, and the physician is considering the possibility of ARDS. To rule out a cardiac cause, a pulmonary artery wedge pressure, PAWP, measurement is obtained. As a nurse, you recognize that a specific reading indicates that this type of respiratory failure is not cardiac related. What is that measurement reading? A. Greater than 28 mmHg. B. Less than 40 mmHg. C. Greater than 52 mmHg. D. Less than 18 mmHg. The correct answer is D. A pulmonary artery wedge pressure measures the left atrial pressure. The pulmonary catheter is wedged with a balloon in the pulmonary arterial branch to gauge the pressure. If the reading is less than 18 mmHg, it suggests that the respiratory failure is not primarily a cardiac issue, but is more likely associated with ARDS. Therefore, the pulmonary edema is a result of damage to the alveolar capillary membrane leading to fluid leakage into the alveolar sac, rather than a manifestation of heart problems such as heart failure. The next NCLEX review question is, 
A client with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD, is admitted to the hospital with increased shortness of breath and respiratory distress. What should the nurse identify as a potential life-threatening complication in this client? A. Respiratory acidosis. B. Respiratory alkalosis. C. Hypertension. D. Hyperventilation. The answer? A. Respiratory acidosis. In individuals with COPD, the ability to eliminate carbon dioxide is compromised due to airway obstruction and reduced lung function. This impairment leads to the retention of carbon dioxide, causing respiratory acidosis. Elevated carbon dioxide levels result in increased blood acidity, posing a risk of life-threatening complications, such as respiratory failure and respiratory arrest. It is crucial for healthcare providers to promptly address respiratory acidosis in COPD patients to prevent severe outcomes. Let's explore the next NCLEX question. A client diagnosed with asthma has been prescribed a short-acting beta agonist, SABA inhaler, such as albuterol. Which of the following actions by the client demonstrates the correct utilization of the inhaler? A. Reserving the use of the inhaler exclusively for asthma attacks. B. Inhaling rapidly and deeply through the mouthpiece. C. Holding the breath for 5 seconds after inhalation. D. Exhaling forcefully into the inhaler prior to usage. Correct answer is C. Holding the breath for 5 seconds after inhalation. Holding the breath for at least 5 seconds after inhaling the medication promotes optimal absorption of the drug, such as albuterol, into the lungs. Inhaling too quickly and deeply may result in swallowing the medication, diminishing its effectiveness. Exhaling into the inhaler or restricting its use to asthma attacks are incorrect practices. Moving to the next NCLEX questions and answers. A client diagnosed with pneumonia is currently experiencing a decline in oxygen saturation levels. What nursing intervention should be given the highest priority? A. Applying oxygen via face mask. B. Providing chest physiotherapy. C. Administering an oral antipyretic medication. D. Elevating the head of the bed. The correct answer? A. Applying oxygen via face mask. The primary focus in a client with reduced oxygen saturation levels is to enhance oxygenation. The top priority nursing intervention is to apply oxygen through a face mask or another Stand appropriate code, oxygen delivery code. system to raise oxygen levels and prevent hypoxemia. While administering an oral antipyretic medication, elevating the head of the bed, and providing chest physiotherapy are important interventions, they are not as critical as promptly addressing the issue of inadequate oxygenation. Here is another NCLEX review question. What precautionary measures should the nurse employ when attending to a client diagnosed with tuberculosis? A. Droplet precautions. B. Airborne precautions. C. Protective isolation precautions. D. Contact precautions. Correct answer? B. Airborne precautions. Tuberculosis, TB, is primarily transmitted through the air via infectious airborne particles. To safeguard against the spread of TB, the nurse should implement airborne precautions. This involves placing the client in a negative pressure room, utilizing respiratory protection such as an N95 respirator or a higher grade mask, and practicing thorough hand hygiene. It is important to note that contact precautions are applied for diseases transmitted through direct contact. Droplet precautions for those spread by large respiratory droplets, and protective isolation precautions for clients with compromised immune systems. However, in the case of TB, airborne precautions are the most appropriate preventive measures. A nurse is administering aminophiline, theophylline, to a client with emphysema. What is the primary action of this medication? A. Suppress the cough. B. Enhance expectoration. C. Prevent infection. D. Relax smooth muscles of the bronchial airway. Correct answer? D. Relax smooth muscles of the bronchial airway. Aminophiline belongs to a class of medications called bronchodilators. 
These drugs work by influencing enzymes known as phosphodiesterase, specifically inhibiting type 3 and type 4 isoenzymes. This inhibition leads to increased levels of cyclic adenosine monophosphate, CAMP, and cyclic 3 and 5 guanosine monophosphate within the tissues. The resultant effect is the relaxation of smooth muscles in the bronchial airway. Understanding the terminology associated with respiratory medications is essential. Antitussives are drugs designed to suppress the cough reflex. They act on the cough control center in the medulla to mitigate persistent coughing, preventing muscle strain and reducing irritation in the respiratory tract. Expectorants, on the other hand, such as guaifenesin, work by thinning and loosening mucus in the airways. These drugs aid in clearing congestion and making breathing easier by facilitating the removal of excess mucus from the respiratory system. In the context of emphysema, a condition characterized by airway obstruction and reduced elasticity by the lung tissue, bronchodilators like aminophylline play a crucial role. By relaxing the smooth muscles in the bronchial airway, these medications help alleviate symptoms and improve airflow, contributing to enhanced respiratory function in individuals with emphysema. Next, NCLEX questions and answers. A client needs a radial arterial blood gas, ABG, drawn, and the nurse must perform an Allen's test before collecting the sample. Which action should the nurse take during the test? A. Occlude the brachial and radial arteries, then release them and observe the hand circulation. B. Compress the radial and ulnar arteries, release one, assess the hand's color, and repeat the process with the other artery. C. Apply pressure to the radial artery and monitor for color changes in the affected hand. D. Apply pressure to the ulnar artery and observe for color changes in the affected hand. The correct answer is B. Compress the radial and ulnar arteries, release one, assess the hand's color, and repeat the process with the other artery. Before obtaining an ABG, the nurse performs an Allen's test to assess collateral circulation in the hand. This involves compressing both the radial and ulnar arteries while the client clenches and releases their fist, causing the hand to become pale. The nurse then releases pressure on one artery at a time, observing for quick restoration of circulation. If collateral circulation is adequate, the blood sample can be safely drawn. During a client assessment, a nurse observes a barrel chest in an individual with chronic airflow limitation. From this finding, the nurse concludes that the client is likely experiencing which type of chronic airflow limitation? A. Chronic obstructive bronchitis B. Bronchial asthma C. Emphysema D. Bronchial asthma and bronchitis Correct answer? C. Emphysema In the case of emphysema, there is alveolar hyperinflation and a flattened diaphragm, leading to an increased anterior-posterior diameter, commonly described as a barrel chest. Additionally, individuals with emphysema exhibit dyspnea with prolonged expiration and hyperresonance upon percussion. Let's begin another NCLEX question and answers. What diet is most suitable for a client with COPD? A. High-calorie, high-protein diet. B. Bland, soft diet. C. Low-sodium diet. D. Low-fat, low-cholesterol. The correct answer is A. High-calorie, high-protein diet. Clients with COPD benefit from consuming high-calorie, high-protein meals to preserve nutritional status and counteract weight loss associated with increased respiratory effort. Encourage small, frequent meals and a daily intake of 20 to 30 grams of fiber from sources like bread, pasta, nuts, seeds, fruits, and vegetables. Incorporate a good protein source at least twice daily to support respiratory muscle strength, such as milk, eggs, cheese, meat, fish, poultry, nuts, and dried beans or peas. A 30-year-old male patient with a history of asthma is admitted to the emergency department. The nurse notes that the client is dyspneic with a respiratory rate of 33 breaths per minute, nasal flaring, and use of accessory muscles. Auscultation of the lung fields reveals greatly diminished breath sounds. Based on these findings, what actions should the nurse take to initiate care of the client? A. Administer albuterol, a short-acting bronchodilator. B. Draw blood for an ABG analysis and send the client for a chest x-ray. C. 
Encourage the client to relax and breathe slowly through the mouth. D. Initiate oxygen therapy and reassess the client in 10 minutes. Correct answer is A. Administer albuterol. In an acute asthma attack, diminished or absent breath sounds can indicate a lack of air movement in the lungs, suggesting impending respiratory failure. The priority in care for this client is immediate intervention with inhaled bronchodilators. Albuterol, a short-acting bronchodilator, is commonly used in such situations. All other measures, including obtaining an ABG, chest x-ray, encouraging relaxation, and initiating oxygen therapy are important, but can cause a delay in bronchodilation, which is crucial for optimal outcomes during an acute asthma exacerbation. Let's begin another NCLEX question and answer. In the management of acute asthma, a patient is prescribed a short-term course of corticosteroid therapy, specifically oral prednisone. What is the scientific basis for utilizing steroids, such as prednisone, in patients with asthma? A. Corticosteroids facilitate bronchodilation. B. Corticosteroids serve as mucolytic agents. C. Corticosteroids exert an anti-inflammatory effect. D. Corticosteroids prevent the onset of respiratory infections. The correct answer is C. Corticosteroids exert an anti-inflammatory effect. Oral corticosteroids are employed in asthma management due to their anti-inflammatory properties. These agents mitigate bronchial edema and reduce mucus secretion, primarily through the suppression of inflammatory processes within the airways. At the physiological level, prednisone diminishes airway inflammation, curtails mucus production, and enhances the efficacy of beta agonists in smooth muscle. A nurse is administering metaproteranol through a metered dose inhaler to a patient, following prescription of two puffs every four hours. The nurse emphasizes the importance of promptly reporting any potential side effects. What adverse reactions related to metaproteranol should the nurse instruct the patient to watch for? A. Peripheral edema. B. Arrhythmias. C. Brachycardia. D. Constipation. The correct answer is B. Arrhythmias. The nurse should educate the patient on the significance of reporting irregular heart rhythms, tachycardia, or anginal symptoms promptly to the healthcare provider when using metaproteranol. This medication exerts an adrenergic influence on beta adrenergic receptors in the heart, potentially leading to arrhythmias. It is crucial information, particularly for patients with known cardiac disorders. What is one of the most common precipitating factors for an acute asthma attack that the nurse should emphasize in teaching for a client with asthma? A. Occupational exposure to toxins. B. Exercising in cold temperatures. C. Exposure to cigarette smoke. D. Viral respiratory infections. Correct answer is D. Viral respiratory infections. The most frequent precipitator of asthma attacks is viral respiratory infections. Clients with asthma should take precautions to avoid individuals with flu or cold symptoms and should receive annual flu vaccinations. Asthma is characterized by acute, reversible airway inflammation triggered by exposure to environmental factors. This process starts with inhaling irritants or allergens, leading to bronchial hypersensitivity, airway inflammation, and increased mucus production. This culminates in a significant rise in airway resistance, particularly during expiration. What do basilar crackles indicate when heard during lung auscultation in a client? A. Produced by airflow across passages narrowed by secretions. B. Usually more prominent during expiration. C. Found primarily in pleura. D. Caused by the sudden opening of alveoli. The correct answer is D. Caused by the sudden opening of alveoli. Basilar crackles are typically heard during inspiration and are caused by the sudden opening of alveoli. These discrete, non-continuous sounds originate from the base of the lungs and may be described as sounding wet or dry. The presence of basilar crackles suggests excess fluid in the airways, leading to the bubbling or crackling sound. Here is another NCLEX review question. Following a thoracentesis, which clinical manifestations suggest a complication requiring immediate notification of the physician? A. Low blood pressure and hypothermia. B. Tachycardia and pallor. C. Hyperthermia and hypertension. D. Serosanguineous drainage from the puncture site. Correct answer. B. Tachycardia and pallor. 
Tachycardia and pallor are indicative of shock, suggesting a compromised venous return, possibly due to excessive fluid removal or a mediastinal shift following thoracentesis. It is essential to promptly notify the physician in the presence of these symptoms. If a patient on a ventilator continues to hypoventilate due to respiratory muscle weakness, the nurse will continually assess for a complication of A. Metabolic acidosis B. Respiratory alkalosis C. Respiratory acidosis D. Metabolic alkalosis Correct answer is C. Respiratory acidosis in a ventilated patient, hypoventilation may result from conditions such as respiratory muscle weakness. This weakness can be caused by neuromuscular disorders, drug-induced sedation, or inadequate ventilator settings. Respiratory acidosis, marked by elevated carbon dioxide levels and an increase in hydrogen ion concentration, leading to decreased pH in arterial blood is a potential complication. The nurse should closely monitor ventilator settings, assess for signs of respiratory muscle fatigue, and ensure adequate sedation management to prevent or promptly address respiratory acidosis in ventilated patients with conditions contributing to hypoventilation. While working in the ICU, a nurse caring for an intubated patient placed on a ventilator notices that the low tidal volume alarm is continuously sounding. What should be the nurse's initial action? A. Inflate the endotracheal tube cuff. B. Check ventilator connections. C. Notify the physician. D. Initiate manual ventilation using a bag valve mask. The correct answer is B. Verify ventilator connections. In the ICU setting, when the low tidal volume alarm persists, the nurse's initial action should be to check ventilator connections. Loose or disconnected ventilator connections can compromise the delivery of tidal volume. If a problem is identified, it should be promptly addressed. If no immediate issue is found, the nurse may consider initiating manual ventilation using a bag valve mask while involving another healthcare provider to reevaluate and confirm the integrity of the ventilator connections.